Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am so excited for today's episode because I am doing another author interview, but I am doing an author interview with a friend of mine, which is always exciting. That's something that I just love. I love meeting new authors and reading new books that I might not have read otherwise, but it's also a lot of fun to catch up with uh, old friends and talk about their books and their writing and find out about that process, etc. So today's author interview with, is with author Mitchell F. Jones, and he has two novels, two mysteries currently out. They are Murder in Old Maine and Dead Men Can't Murder. They are both in a series. They are around a main character named Michael Airley. And they are the first two in a planned series of eight. So there are potentially six more that are coming out, which is fun. So I haven't done many mysteries on the podcast. I enjoy mysteries, but these were fun to read because, of course, they're written uh, by a good friend of mine. And they're interesting in a lot of ways. They're set in the early 80s. And so you get to kind of go back to that time period. And it, the, the main character, Michael Airley, is a professor. He works in, with computers, and of course, computers weren't as prevalent then as they are now, so you get to see some of those transitions as, because Michael Airley has some connections through his past military experience, so he has access to computers that mm, general people wouldn't, you know, everyday people wouldn't have had during that time period. So it was really interesting to read that and, and try to cast my brain back. I wasn't terribly old in the early 80s, but trying to cast my brain back to that time period and think, wow, I, I was that possible? I don't remember that. And Mitch talks about that in our interview. So let me give you a little bit of background on each of the books, and we'll talk about that before we start into the interview. So as I said, the first one is Murder in Old Maine, and its description is this. This wasn't right. Mike had started teaching to get away from seeing dead bodies. Now there he was, staring at the corpse of a colleague slumped at his desk. All the signs point to Gill, a nervous undergrad with a bone to pick with the late Dr. Clerkwell. But something doesn't add up. When a stack of blank diplomas goes missing, Mike realizes that there's much more going on at his quiet rural university than he ever could have imagined. Pushed from his peaceful sanctuary, he's forced to call in the military training that he had hoped was all behind him. Full of twists and turns, Murder in Old Maine is a thrilling, thrilling whodunit full of pride, greed, and lust for money that will keep you wondering if anyone can really be trusted. So as I mentioned, this is set in the early 80s. It is set on a fictional campus. Michael is a, Mike is a professor on that campus, and as I mentioned, he works in computers. So now he gets drawn into this murder mystery, and the, the first person who's murdered is just really, really, really dislikable. Nobody is really that sad that he's dead, which is a very sad commentary on his life. And I will say this about this book. I enjoyed the story very much. I enjoyed the character development and the the setting development. As I said, this will be the this is the first of what is planned to be an eight book series. So we're going to get to know Michael Airley and uh, some of the other main characters much better. So you get that set up and Mike uh, Mitch talks about his how he plans characters and how how much background information he has on those characters. So the characters are really well developed. They're really well thought out. The editing on this book is not 
as good as it could be. I'm just going to be forthright with you and say that for me personally and my own personal reading style, I struggled a little bit with some of the editing. So just go in knowing that, knowing that the story is great, the mystery is fun, the characters are interesting, but the editing in this first one is a little tricky. It's a little tough. And so I still recommend the book. I'm not saying don't read it because it, all the other elements are there and the editing is much much better in the second one it's mu it flows much more much more smoothly and you get more of the characters you get more of the story and you learn start learning more about not only Michael Airley but the other characters that are in his world as well and so i i definitely enjoyed the second one more simply because it was more of my personal style of writing and everyone is different so don't take the editing of the first one as a reason not to read that book it, it could you know you can read it and it won't you won't even notice it but for me personally everyone has different reading styles everyone has different ways that they hear a book in their head and this one was a little tough for me to hear in my head in a smooth fashion so that's just my perspective as I said the second one for me was much better edited and uh, it flowed a lot more smoothly for me so I was able to enjoy the story more and that story is as follows this is dead men can't murder at 10 a.m. Tom Coleman saw a man he knew was dead by 10 p.m. he was dead and the man walked free when Mike Airley, former colonel in the Army and Vietnam vet, arrived at the dorm, Tom's body was hanging cold from the rafters. He wouldn't be the first or last soldier to take his own life after the horrors of Nam, but something didn't add up. As Mike picks, picks apart the clues, he realizes that the death is not at all as it seems. To complicate matters, he also has to fight a pervasive stigma against suicide in the veteran community. Racing against the clock before the killer strikes again, he draws on all of his law enforcement connections, but the deeper he digs, the more dangerous it becomes. Dead Men Can't Murder is the gripping second story in the life of Mike Airley and the sequel to Murder in Old Maine. So this is, as it says, the second book in this series, and you get a different, it's still the same setting, it still takes place on the campus where Mike teaches, but you get this different set of circumstances. So you see a little bit more of flashbacks of Mike's military experience you you get to see the aftermath of some of the veterans who've come back from Vietnam who are on the campus who share their stories in various ways as Mike goes about investigating what turns out to be a murder it's presented as a suicide but it does turn out to be a murder and you learn that very quickly in the book so I'm not ruining anything so I liked both of these books. They were really great mysteries. I am enjoying learning, you know, learning about the characters and getting to know them. I'm in, interested to see where the series goes from here and how the characters will continue to develop and interact with one another, etc. So I'm going to stop talking now in terms of my own views on the books and I'm going to turn to the interview with author Mitchell F. Jones, author of Murder in Old Maine and Dead Men Can't Murder. So here is that interview. He joined me via Skype from his daughter's home in Texas. Hi, Mitch. How are you? I'm doing very fine, Sarah. It's good to see you and talk to you. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Appreciate it very much myself. So I'm going to jump right in, and I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit. So whatever you're okay. comfortable sharing, go ahead. Well, when people talk to me and say, you know, and find out that I write uh, mystery stories and things, they always want to know, you know, what, what, what moves you to do that. And I think for me, the autobiographical aspect of it is, is that uh, when we moved to the United States, I was born in Scotland. My mother and father were both born in Scotland. So the Scottish connection is strong. My mom had actually moved to the United States before World War II, become a U.S. citizen and uh when uh, I married my dad in the United States during the war, and then they both went back to Scotland. But when we came to the United States, two things happened that I think are formative to why I wanted to, why I like to write and, and always have. Um, the first was I discovered uh, very quickly that I lived in two different worlds. Inside our house was very, very British and Scottish. 
And if you came into our house, there was more than likely going to be one of two things on the record player, and it was always on. One was Scottish music by some of the great Scottish singers in English and Gaelic. And my dad actually uh, understood Gaelic. He had a brother who was a poet in Gaelic, in Scottish Gaelic. Or my mother would have her records on and they were always opera. So it was Italian and French and all this sort of stuff. So there was always lots of languages going on. And I realized very quickly that inside my house was one world and outside the house when I went to school was a very different world. Eastern Pennsylvania in the late 40s and early 50s was a little more provincial. And if you came from a different county, you were a verdunte Auslander, which is Pennsylvania Dutch for stupid foreigner. Uh, and if you came from a different country, they didn't even have terms that went that bad, you know? Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so that, so I got fascinated by language and how language worked and how the fact that my father, oh, I don't know why, he talked a lot different than most of the people did out where I was going to school, and I don't know why. And, you know, I had an accent in the house. I didn't use it outside because I wanted to survive on the playground. And I didn't find out until I went to my 50th high school anniversary. I thought I covered it up very well. And they said, oh, Mitch, we always knew when you were upset because you started talking Scottish. <sighs> what can you do? I unfortunately have to interject here just for a moment. We do have to take our first break of the podcast, but you can tell from just these first couple of minutes of the podcast, of the interview, excuse me, that Mitch is a born storyteller. He has a million stories. Some of them he's written down, lots of them are in his head, and it, you can tell when I worked with him, he had uh, so many stories, so many hilarious stories, and you'll be able to see more of that. He is going to talk a little bit more about some of the autobiographical elements in these books and in his own why he writes mysteries, and that'll be after the after this first break. So stay tuned, and I will be right back. Still on the search of that one true love, on the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. We are speaking today with author Mitchell F. Jones about the first two novels in his Michael Airley mystery series. And he's telling about some of the autobiographical elements that go into his writing about his Scottish parents and the music that played in their home. And then there was another, uh, another incident in his life that really affected why he writes what he writes and why he do, he loves mysteries so much and he's going to talk about that now so let's get back to the interview and then the other the other autobiographical thing is is uh i got rheumatic fever very quick very not long after coming to the united states and uh you know a three four year old boy with rheumatic fever in that period of time was told that i had to spend all day all every in bed 24 hours a day the only time i was allowed to get up was for a call of nature other than that eat it there eat in bed you know and my mom would uh read uh, to me but you can't sit there and read all the time so she taught me how to read and i began reading uh first you know donald duck and mickey mouse comic books and stuff like that and then i got she found some of the uh, classic comics read those and then i discovered um uh, Hardy Boys mystery stories and began to read those. Graduated up to Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes stories, and I have been an avid interest in how language works, mystery stories, and things like that. So it seemed to make sense when I decided to uh, go into writing fiction to do the, uh, the 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 mystery genre. So I've known I've known you since two thousand eight when we started working together in Montana. And I've always known, you know, you've always, you've always been a writer since I've known you. Um, just, you love to write, you love words, you love all of, uh, language. When did you start actually, 
have you always have you been writing fiction during that time, or did you decide specifically to start writing a novel? I've, I've always written fiction stories. I've written a lot of short stories. Most of them uh, got more published in like you know high school stuff and college stuff. I didn't get anything commercially in terms of fiction. I did write a number of things nonfiction, particularly about Japan. I had a, a series in uh, Allentown Morning Call uh, back in the 70s about Japanese culture and things like that. But what happened more than anything else is that in you know doing family counseling and doing uh, chaplaincy-like work in a hospital or things like that, one of the things you're supposed to do is write verbatims. Mm-hmm. And uh, we work with your supervisor and you have a verbatim, but your verbatim can't identify person you're talking about so that the paper got out of your hand somebody wouldn't be able to say oh that's Herman Cappuccino I know who they're talking about uh, you can't do that so you have to come up with fictitious names and you have to change things just enough that somebody can't say oh, I think I understand who this is I suddenly realized I've been writing short story fiction based on actual stuff for a long time and uh, I actually started writing the first book, uh, uh, Murder in Old Maine, uh, in the year that it set, in 1981. Oh, okay. And uh, I played around with that book and that story for a, for a long time, and uh, uh, I used it in its earlier drafts to get rid of some of my anxieties and tensions and upsetness. And you know, so the act, the fact that the main, the victim in that story is a crotchety old professor who you know, makes people unhappy is totally fictitious and is not at all like any professor from the college that I went to by any means or thought. Oh no, I can't imagine you would ever know someone that cranky. That's correct. He really is a dislikable character. <laughs> well, I, he, he is, a, he is a, a character that has certainly pieces of a lot of things I've discovered over my life that I don't like about some people. Yep. And I don't think I've known anybody who had all of them like he does. Right. Uh, Thankfully. He is a good protagonist um, because he is such a cranky person. I think there's a a scene in there where I talk about, uh, you know, I was so surprised he's standing at the door and somebody walks in the room and they say, isn't it a beautiful day? What do you mean it's a beautiful day? It's not a beautiful day. It's a horrible day. You know, and then... Two seconds later, somebody else walks in and goes, uh, you know, isn't it a horrible day out there? What do you mean it's a horrible day? You should be happy. It's, you know, it's wonderful. That little episode I actually witnessed. Yes. Somewhere uh, in my life. Yes. I, I think I've witnessed something very similar in my yeah. life. You know, there's so, just those people that never are happy yeah, with anything. They just, they just seem to got to be grumpy. And then some of the other people who were in it. I realized, you know, so my 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 detective, Michael Early, the, the last name is actually uh, the last name of my great 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 grandfather, who was from the Isle of Skye, and uh, the Early name. It's the family name. I did a lot of checking to make sure that there wasn't a Michael Early that, you know, did some things and discovered that that part of my family had emigrated to Australia, and there's an Early beach in in Australia that probably was uh, an area that my my ancestors had gone to. There are no Airlies there now. And then, of course, his best friend and colleague is Alexander uh, uh, Fraser, and he's very Scottish. And, you know, if anything, he's, he's, if I hear the voice, it's, it's my grandfather Anderson. You know, he's got that voice. And my grandfather Jones was uh, an electrical engineer. And there's something about the name of Fraser that later on in, a, in another volume is going to have a something that my great that actually my great my grandfather did as a as an electrical engineer in Scotland. He says I'm a he said, I'm a Jones who can really zap ya <laughs> <laughs> So that that line's gonna show up in a in a future book, yes. I think. And I don't and think my grandfather will sue me. <laughs> I, well he's gonna have to haunt you in order to do so. That's true. Well he probably does do that, but that's another issue. So so it just became natural for me to continue to write. And I love to do it. I love writing. I always have enjoyed it. It's a good exercise. It's a way of, of, of clearing my mind and coming up with ideas. And I I can, I come up with plots in my head all the time. My wife is forever telling me as we're driving along, pay attention, stop planning that next scene. Oh, sorry, dear, what, what, what street are we on? You know, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I try to spend... Uh, when we, we're we're in transition right now, as, as you know about that, and, and moving to to Texas, uh, but when we have a house and when we are uh, more settled in, I usually spend about two and a half hours every day writing. Okay. Do you like to write at the same time each day, or just whenever you have a time, a moment? 
Generally speaking, it's late morning. Um, you know, I'll get up, think about a few things. I, I discovered that if I did it first thing in the morning, I end up waking up inside my head earlier in bed with plots running around, and then I don't sleep, so I can't do that. I, I need to uh, give myself some rest. But try to keep a regular schedule and try to write something um, on most days. Okay. And I have notebooks all over the place, so I'm always coming up with the little, little stories I have. At this moment in time, you know, there are two Michael Lairley uh, books published. I'm hoping to have, I have eight planned. Oh, wow. Three, three more are in, I have the third one is in the, the final author rewrite right now. And the, the next two after that are uh, written and shaped out, but they'll have to go back and do some rewriting and stuff like that. And, and then I've come up with another character. I've actually written a short story and submitted it to a mystery writer magazine. Haven't heard whether they're going to accept it or not. Sir William Flower. Okay. Uh, he's, uh, he's going to be uh, another detective that I, that I have. And then I'm... Um, Do you think you'll I'm, write a longer story about Sir William? Oh, yeah. I've got a couple in my mind on what I want to do with that. And then then I have Jillian James in my head for a, for a uh, another uh, detective down the line. So. so let's talk about the two that are out. Um, let's start with Murder in Old Maine. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. And you said you started writing it in the early 80s. So is that why you, you, you left the setting during that I time left period? The yeah. And I did some research about uh, when I started to write about uh, in 1981, it, computers were some, you know, were a new thing. So I had, I started to do a lot of studying just about computers, both because I was using it in work, but also it was starting to fit into the story. And uh, eventually I was doing a job in Bozeman, uh, Montana, and there is the Smithsonian Institute's satellite museum of computers. In Bozeman? And I time in Bozeman yeah oh. uh, and uh, I spent a couple of long weekends in that museum researching the history of, uh, of uh, computers and there's going to be some stuff coming up in the third book that came right out of that research so yeah it, uh, there were times in both books when I was reading and it, Michael or his business partner Alex would be doing something on the computer and I'd be like could you do that in 1981? You know, like I kept having to take my brain back and, and he does have um, military experience that gives him a little bit more ability mm -hmm. to do things that your average person wouldn't be able to do in 1981. Right. Um, but everything that he does is was possible in 1981. Right. I, I, I've done the research, did that work at that museum particularly. Um, in the third book, there is going to be a place where a computer... A punch card shows up as a clue and Alex will translate it for people and it's a specific punch card that would have been used on a com on a on a computing uh, machine in the 1940s oh, okay and uh, so that's researched and done pretty well it, it's fun I, I've done a lot of uh, writing uh, classes I have a group of people that I uh, uh, up in Montana, most of them now, uh, who, uh, you know, I would give parts of my writing, they'd give me parts and we would do classes and stuff like that. And, and I did, uh, there's a, a scene in the first book, I think I eventually edited it out, but he, he goes to the phone to make a call and I have him go, oh, what's that new phone number for the, for the fire department? Oh, it's, you know, five, 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 da, 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 whatever it is. And one of my people said, well, why doesn't he just call none? Because I did the check. And in 1981, 911 did not exist in rural Pennsylvania. Right. If you put make a mistake like that, boy, you'll get letters from all sorts of people. <laughs> I didn't get one. That dish doesn't work. It didn't exist. And, and uh, my first uh, professional edit I had done of the book, the editor uh, said, why, why, why are you having him talk about a... Uh, a, a philosopher, Pascal. That doesn't make any sense. Is it Pascal's a computer language? Uh, He's teaching a course on Pascal, and I even said it, it a computer language, and did. he liked it with certain characteristics. My, the editor didn't catch that, and she says, "Why is he doing? Why is he teaching a class about philosophy?" Oh, that's <laughs> funny. That's so. Hilarious. Let me jump in here one more time. We are going to take our second break of the podcast. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
Podcast. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. about that main character, Michael Airely. So let's get back to that interview. Talk a little bit more about the main character, Michael Airely, and his, um, just give us a little background on him. Okay. First of all, I write a biography on every main character. Okay. I have reams of information about Michael Airely. I can tell you where he was born and when he was born and who his parents were. And one, his mother was French, his father's Scottish. Uh, he grew up, was born in eastern Pennsylvania. He got interested in, in languages because his mother spoke to him only in French at home. His father had the Scottish dialect. Um, that's, that's somewhat autobiographical. Not that my mother was French, but they talked to me in another language called Scottish. And uh, so, you know, I had those experiences. And um, I set the, the book in that uh, 1980 time frame. Mike Lurley is basically born in 1935. And which makes him in his early 40s at that point in time. Uh, he was He's a bright man who got, uh, uh, was noticed for his language abilities and brought into the military in the late uh, 50s, early 60s, because they knew things were going to be happening and they wanted good people. And so he, he his natural skill set allows him to, to come up and do that. He's a very sensitive man. And uh, one of the things I've tried to kind of get across without telling it, but showing it, is that he needs to be alone, but he's alone in a crowd. He discovered that if he goes to a crowd of people and he pretends like he's reading or just sits there in the corner, people watching, people tend to not talk to you. And you can be alone, have your alone time, but you're not lonely. You have people around you, and that characteristic shows up in a number of places uh, in uh, the books that I've been writing about him. And Alex is a, is a really good friend of his. Michael's first wife, Pamela, died very sudden, very quickly after they came back, came to St. Matthew University of, of a very virulent cancer. He's very deeply affected by that. Uh, his good friend, Pastor Sarah, is uh, He's totally based on me because I was six in 1981, right? Exactly. <laughs> I knew, you, I knew you were going to be very precocious, so that's why I, I wrote it. It's all about you. That's correct. <laughs> you spelled my name wrong, just so you know. <laughs> I spelled it with the alternative spelling. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I try, to, I try to have characters who've got personality and history, and I know what they are. I don't necessarily write all of that stuff in. A lot of times, one of the hardest things about writing is you've got to be a uh, You've got to be a passionate about your about your storyline, passionate about your characters, and willing to kill them off. That's true. Or at least take and rip out sections. Right. You go. Some of the best stuff I've written is in notebooks, right. in book because it just slowed the book down too much. Right. And uh, so you have to be willing to do that. And actually, is that action of self-editing. I have found to be a very helpful just for me in my my, my everyday life. Mm -hmm. There, are, it's, I know it's hard to believe you've known me a lot of years, but there are occasions where I really need to edit myself and not just say what just suddenly popped into my head. So. I've never experienced that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you are okay, always deep and insightful and profound. Thank you very much. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I only accept large bills. <laughs> Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, uh, so it, it's, it's a fun 
fun process. I really enjoy it. Good. I can tell. Your second book is um, Dead Men Can't Murder, which mm -hmm. is an interesting title, a descriptive title. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. How was that different? How was the writing process different for your second novel than your first? Well, in that particular one, I, I, I've done a lot of work in family counseling, and uh, I actually worked for a while as a, a volunteer chaplain for um, a police department in Oregon. And I also, uh, in graduate school, worked um, for Project Newgate as a counselor. Um, and Project Newgate was a program that worked with convicted felons, most of them armed robbers and murderers. And they were they did um, uh, educational uh, release, but they weren't released. They were still under. And so I actually had to become a sworn officer of the Oregon prison guards and uh, and carried a card that I was that I did that. So th that particular now none of the men and they were all men in that program. None of those men are the people in the book, but some of their stories, some of the things that I heard or I learned. And it was we had one particular guy who suffered very badly from post-traumatic stress syndrome. It was a term that wasn't you had, hadn't been coined yet. And he would see people. He would see people. He would see dead people. And, you know, you'd, you'd come in, come back to the place and he would go, you know, Mitch, I saw Herman Cappuccino this today. I said, John, you know, and that wasn't his name, by the way. John, you know, Herman's dead. Yeah, I know. But my God, it was so scary. And he, he's the one who said, a dead man can't kill you, can he? OK. And that's so that's the origin of that uh, um, title it reworked slightly. Right. And, and you get that uh, right away in the book because, like, in the very mm -hmm. first page, the the character who is is killed, Tom Coleman, sees Michael Early, the the main yep. character, and has one of those experiences because he thinks mm -hmm. Michael's dead. And mm -hmm. then we get more of what goes on after that, and it's it just sounds horrible, you know. I mean, you can you can really mm -hmm. feel the the um the trauma the trauma that he has gone through and is continuing to go through in his life because of his time in Vietnam. Yeah. And it's it's uh, I was a little older when I was in college. I, I didn't serve in the military. Um, my eyes were very bad and, mm -hmm. and I didn't pass the physical. But uh, because I was the same age of a number of the Vietnam War vets who were at the college at the same time I was, I was an honorary Veterans Club member. Okay. And so I got to know a number of, of the people. And again, none of them are in the book straight. Right. But, the 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 kind of you know pathos and angst that they experience with these kinds of things and the flashbacks that some would have and you know you could you when you were with some of the some of the guys said the same kind of situation when I was doing the chaplaincy work with the um, the police department discovered that police officers uh, see the world very clearly there are five categories of people five there are police officers which I wasn't so you can't be one of those. There are lawyers and judges, you know, which I wasn't one of those. You can't be those. So I left three categories left. The three categories were perpetrator, victim, witness. And if you don't fit into one of those five categories, you are not a person. So one of the things that it happens for the police officers, and we see this as an ongoing problem in our world today, unless they can put you in one of those categories, you're, you really aren't a person. Now, mm -hmm. Any police officer who listens to this is going to go, wait a minute, that's I always think of people as persons. Certainly you do. I understand that. I'm using a little bit of hyperbola here. But you, but they don't fit into one of those categories. It's hard to know what to do with them. And I think most of us uh, in our world of, that we are a part of, if somebody doesn't have some shared experience with this, it's hard to make a connection. And so I wanted that to come across in that second book. And... Uh, my tagline is at 10 a.m. in the morning, Tom Coleman saw a man he knew was dead. But by 10 p.m., Tom Coleman was dead and the man had walked away. Yeah, it's it, I, it gives me goosebumps to, to hear that. But I know people who've had those kinds of experiences in, in my counseling life. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted some of that to be to bring some reality to this painful circumstance that is out there. And when it's I think our culture needs to try to deal with this better uh the, we're not we're, we're not getting less people with post-traumatic stress syndrome we're getting many many more and uh i i think we can look at some of the things that are going on in our 
world today in the 21st century in 2017 that are results of this kind of post-traumatic stress syndrome going on. Yeah, the, there's definitely elements in the book, even though it's in 1981, that, that you know, don't they're not dated, unfortunately, yeah, in terms right. of emo uh, mental health, emotional health, those sorts of things. How do you trust people? Yeah. It, 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 particularly if you had difficult situations, how can you reach out and trust? And one of my characters in that story uh, is... Um, I think a little bit autobiographical. It's the the uh, Steve character, in the sense that when I, as I said earlier, uh, about living in two worlds, you know, my home that was British and out in the world that was uh, West Eastern Pennsylvania in the 1950s, um, I discovered pretty quickly that it was a little bit hard to trust some of those people out there, if I tried to explain to them why I was feeling some anxiety or some tension or some difficulty at home, they just couldn't understand it. They just simply couldn't understand. I mean, my dad, he had a Scottish accent that you could cut with an ax. He was a brilliant man, brilliant chemist, graduated from college at age 17 in organic chemistry. But he always had trouble in that world of 1950 because he wasn't American. And uh, some way, in some ways, I live in, lived in two cultures. I think I've got several characters who live in more than one culture, and that's, that's out of my own personal life experience. So. We're going to take one more quick break before we wrap up the podcast and the interview with author Mitchell F. Jones. When we come back, he will be speaking more about what is going to happen in the upcoming Michael Early novels. So stay tuned, and we will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Welcome back to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. We are now going to wrap up our interview with author Mitchell Jones on his Michael Airley Mystery Series. You said the, the third one is ready for, you know, editing and those sorts of things. And you yeah. have eight at least planned. Mm -hmm. So what is next for Michael? You know, not giving well, too much away, but... Sure. The next one, the working title for it is uh, Murders, plural, Murders Cast Long Shadows. Okay. And uh, it's, it starts with a, a, a farmhouse up the hill from where Michael's home is. There's a fire. And when they get there, they discover there's an elderly man. He's only three months away from turning 100. And he has died in the fire. And the initial impl impl implication is, is that, you know, he accidentally kicks over uh, something and, is, and catches the place on fire. But Michael's observation abilities recognize none of that's true. It's all faked out. And we then, so then we start to look at the history of this man. And the history is, uh, I, I love to do the historical research, is that he was born in Germany in 1882. So he's just a few months away from being 100. And he is a distant relative of Hermann Goering. And so there's those horrific things of World War II that echo through this man's life. And... Uh, he was a brewer, and he was brought to the United States in 1930, actually 1928. And I wonder why a brewer would be brought to the United States, and who might have brought him? Gee, John Banyan, or um, let's see, maybe um, Al Capone, or uh, I'm not, you know, there's just a number of possibilities. And obviously, somebody has tried to get some information from this old man, and he died. Hmm. And uh, so we then we go on a quest to find out which one of those ancient murders, and of course when we're talking about World War II, or the you know the Nazi era and and the Al Capone era, there are a lot of old murders mm -hmm. that casting shadows across this man's life, and across Mike Early's life and other people who knew him, and uh, he lives in a uh, an old shack behind a house, and this is also somewhat autobiographical. Uh, 
not far from the farm that I grew up is, there was a very old farm, they had a little shack in the back, there was an elderly man whose son had been killed in World War I, and he still had the man, his son, seeing eye dog. And so some of those things show up in the book, and it's, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, One thing I want to I want to bring up is that um, Michael Airley is a professor. He's not, a, you know, he's not a police officer. So uh, talk a little bit about why he keeps getting involved in solving these murders. Well, um, you know, like so many detectives, you know, Miss Marple, why does she? I mean, she's a little old lady who lives next door to a you know, parsonage in, you know, 1930s Britain. How does she get into it? Well, right. the same Mike Lairly does. It just kind of, you know, falls. These things happen around you. I always thought it's just like being, it's like being a relative of Jessica Fletcher from, you know, Murder I was She just Wrote. Just thinking about Murder She Wrote. <laughs> right, because you know, every cousin, every nephew, every niece always gets accused of being a murderer in, right. in those plots. That Everywhere was, she goes, someone gets killed. <laughs> they should start looking at her. Oh, no, me, Jessica. No, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, that's the kind of thing. And he, he does have a background in military intelligence and uh, the computer world. Uh, these are windows that he gets to, to be able to use, tools that he gets to be able to use in his detection. He uses them in the, in the third book to find out more of the history of some of those people from the World War One era, World War Two era, and things like that. I, I'm, I guess I, if I can claim some training, I can claim training as a, as a historian. My undergraduate degrees in history and sociology, and I have graduate uh, 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 work done in Japanese history, language, and literature, as well as uh, you know several other realms. And I'm an unrecovering language aholic. I love to work with language. And Michael Early is probably, if I think of him as an alter ego, he's much more fluent in French than I am, but I do speak French. He's much more fluent in German, which I don't speak at all. You know, he has three or four languages. I'm relatively fluent in Japanese. I mean, we lived in Japan for a number of years and uh, both of our daughters were born in Japan and uh, all of my family. We are a very multilingual family. And yes, you are. Epical. So I have a son-in-law who's Swiss German Swiss French, oh gosh, Claude would shoot me. Swiss French. I was just going to say, isn't he Swiss French? <laughs> yes, he is. Uh, from the French speaking ca canton in Switzerland, speaks perfect French, of course, and German, and Italian, and English. And, you know, my daughter, who lives in Switzerland, is a licensed translator in Japanese, French, and English. Uh, our son She's an author also, isn't she? Yes, she's a published author, award winning author. Michelle mm -hmm. Bela Jones. Uh, Fog Island Mountain, if you get a chance to see that book. Yeah. Uh, she's very talented. Our other daughter is a doctorate and professor at the University of Texas. And her husband, who uh, grew up in Puerto Rico, but he's, his, his father was a marine biologist, uh, he speaks fluent Spanish. So we all get together and uh, it gets to be a real Tower of Babel sometimes. Yeah. But so that's part of the books too, the right. life stuff. I'm a little scared to ask this question because I know you. Um, favorite authors, favorite genres. I mean, this could take like ten years. <laughs> yes, it could. I, I I thought about that when you when you uh, asked me that. And let me make it, it a little simpler. Take ten years. What, what here, do you but... What do you may, Maybe I'll make it a little simpler. What are you reading right now? Oh, uh, right now I'm reading uh, a book by Simon Brett. Uh, he's a, a a contemporary uh, British uh, mystery story writer, writes a couple of different series as I'm reading him. I'm also reading another one, I have to be honest, I can't remember the author's name because I got caught up in the book so much, that's about mis uh, uh, detective stuff happening. It's called The Bow Street Runners, and that's the precursor of Scotland Yard. I started reading uh, you know, Hardy Boy mysteries when I was a young boy, then Sherlock Holmes, of course, Conan Doyle, uh, Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayre, Jacqueline Winspear, uh, 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 I really like her work, I do too. some good stuff, and, it's, and Simon Brett uh, is one that I'm working with now, but I, but I love to read other stuff, I mean, I, I, I started reading Shakespeare as a kid and uh, have several favorite Shakespearean plays and uh, read a lot of stuff. It's, we we used to go on vacation uh, the week after Christmas, and we would go to a place on the Oregon coast, 
and we would take boxes of books. So the two daughters, my wife and I, we would sit there reading. And one, one Christmas, we said to the kids, invite friends. So Jennifer invited one of her friends, who was also a bookaholic, and she sat there with us. Michelle invited one of her friends who wasn't a bookaholic. She walked in one day. She looks at all of us sitting there just reading. She says, is that all you people do on vacations? Read. We all looked up and in one voice says, yep. Yeah. And I to reading our book. <laughs> my poor husband has the same experience with my family. <laughs> He'll come home and it'll just be five people and five different books, you know, and he's like, really? We're not going to do anything? <laughs> we are doing something. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I also like the theater, too. I mean, I have a lot of uh, – I think it, it's part of my visual ability to as – I, as I write my, these books, I see them. I mean, and and I, so I can tell you, and I, you have to be careful. This is some of the stuff I think that sometimes is quite good, but you, have, you can't keep doing all of that. You know, you can go on, on and on and on and on about 19 different things that you're looking at. And it, it's part for me, it makes it alive in my head. But you can't do too much of it when you're writing down, but you have to do enough to make it feel. To be a mystery writer is a little bit like being a magician. You're a conjurer. You have to do something with your right hand to keep people from looking at what you're doing with your left hand so that they get taken off in this direction. And then when it comes to the aha moment, you go, aha, but it can't be hold it. You can't just create somebody and drop them into the plot at the last minute and say, this is the solution. Uh, you know, that just, it, it has to be feasible. And I, I think that I've done that pretty well with these two that are um, done. The second one, uh, Dead Men Can't Murder. The fun thing to be able to do with that it, it was who, you know, which one of these people could have been the dead man because obviously he wasn't dead, and he made Tom dead later in the story, and you have to kind of try to figure out how all that happens. And as Agatha Christie once said, though, you know, you write along, you write along, you write, and you're working hard, and you say, okay, I've finally done this, and then when you do the word count, you go, oh, darn, I've only got 40,000 words. So she always says, I threw in another murder and wrote 20 more thousand words, you know? I don't quite do it that way, dear Agatha, but uh, <laughs> there is some of that that happens. Right. Is there anything else? Um, we've covered a lot, which has been really fun. Anything else that you would like people to know about you or your books? Oh, I do have one question is where can they find your books? Uh, well, they're available. Uh, Frisian Press is the is the publisher mm -hmm. uh, and that's available at uh, from their bookstore directly, um, uh, which is you can get on the Internet. Amazon, you can get them uh, from Amazon. Uh, they're available uh, by special order at 34,000 bookstores uh, worldwide. So th those are the places, uh, okay. Barnes and Noble, uh, you would have to do special orders at that. It's, it's, I'd say probably 5% of people who write books ever get to the point where a bookstore will stock them on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And I, if anybody has any oomph on this, I would love to have Amazon uh, give away the electronic version of mine, maybe 10,000 of them. That mm. would be because that's the best. If people read your books, right. then, uh, you know, they'll come back and look for ones in the future. I, it, basically, my the agents I've worked with, the people I've worked with, the uh, PR people I've worked with, you need to have about three of this with the same detective before things start to click. Okay. I have eight planned. Uh, the fourth one's uh, Bone Fate for Murder, and it starts out in Colmar, France. The next one is called uh, Mail-In Murders, and that one uh, I like the premise of, and I'm not going to say it here because I don't want it stolen since the book isn't written yet, but let's just say Mike gets notes about people being dead and they aren't until afterwards. Interesting. And, you know, we'll see how that one kind of goes. And then How to Kill You at Harrison Hall. Now, that's definitely a working title, but it just had such nice alliteration for me when working on it that it sounded good. It probably won't have that name when it comes out. But uh, we'll, And that would obviously have some of my Japanese life experience in it, as did the first book, mm -hmm. the um, business of uh, doing uh, English as a second language in Japan. I, I did that for five years. I taught at Kagoshima College of Economics in both English and Japanese because mm -hmm. I Japanese. Um, but that world of being going to Japan and being a uh, an English teacher is fraught with all sorts of things, including phonies. And that's, of course, part of the first book. Right. And uh, we'll see what happens. I also have written one completely out of the genre. It's a historical novel 
It takes place in Republican Rome in 81 BC, and it's, it is a mystery story, and it's called Murder on the Street of Harlots. Okay. And, uh, uh, and it has scenes in, in Pompeii and on Vesuvius, all, you know, 150 years before Vesuvius went off. Right. And uh, I loved doing the research for that. And I, I enjoy doing the research for all the books that I write. So pretty much what I write has been well-researched. And if I make a statement about a, you know, a, a punch card for a computer and say it happened in such and such a year, you, you can believe it that it did. Because I've spent time uh, researching it at the Smithsonian um, Museum for Computers, which happens to be in Bozeman, Montana. Of all places, which I just so. learned something about my home state. Yeah. So. I did not know that. All right. Well, thank you so much. You will notice that that ending part cut off rather abruptly. I apologize for that. Uh, there was a little bit more, just the thank yous and the goodbyes, and that seems to have somehow disappeared in the editing process, which is my own fault. I claim user error on that one, and I apologize, but there were thank yous and goodbyes exchanged, as you can imagine. Uh, nothing more was said about the series. It didn't cut off anything important about the books, just, just the wrapping up and the thank yous and the goodbyes, and so I apologize to you, and I apologize apologize to Mitch for cutting off that last little bit of the interview. I want to once again thank my guest for today, author and my friend, Mitchell F. Jones, author of the Michael Airley Mystery Series. Those first two novels, as we've said, are out. They are Murder in Old Maine and Dead Men Can't Murder. The third one will be out um, sometime in the next year, I would imagine, so be on the lookout for that. If you enjoy mysteries, then you should definitely check these out. They are, um, they're very well, the, the stories are very well crafted. The main character is compelling. There's a lot lot of um, auxiliary characters who are also compelling and who have backstories that we're learning more and more about as these novels go on. So again, thank you to Mitch for joining me today and thank you to him for being a really great friend to me over the years. He, like I said, we worked together in Montana for a couple of years and he was one of my favorite supervisors that I've ever had because he was so encouraging of all of the people that he worked with. He really led by building people up rather than tearing people down. And that is always something that I've taken with me throughout the rest of my job experiences. So I want to thank him not only for being on the podcast and for being my friend, but for giving me that wonderful modeling when we worked together. So thank you again for joining me for this podcast. I hope you will join me next time when I will actually be going back to what I said I was going to be doing two weeks ago, which is Dangerous Minds, the book by Janet Ivanovich and Fief Sutton. I scheduled some author interviews, which I love, and I'm so happy that I did, but it did push my, my book review schedule back a little bit. So I'll be doing that next time, and I hope you'll join me for that. As always, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, GSMC Book Review. And you can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any of the apps that you use for your mobile devices. So please go check out all of our family of podcasts. I hope you have a great week. I hope you'll join me next time. But in the meantime, go get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.